Uh, good, good afternoon. So well, well, welcome to the Blue Economies um, third in the 2023 webinar series. Um, I'm Professor Chris Carter and I'm program leader for program number two, um, Seafood and Marine Products. So it's my great pleasure to be able to um, run this, this seminar, which is all about understanding uh, salmon performance. So before we start, I would like to, um, on behalf of the Blue Economy, acknowledge all countries participating in this meeting. I acknowledge their elders and ancestors and their legacy to us. I pay my respects to the traditional owners and to the elders past and present on the land, waters and sea on which we meet. So um, welcome to this um, seminar. Just to quickly introduce the Blue Economy. So you can see that we now have 43, um, 44 partners. Uh, we were founded in 2019 and we're a 10 year CRC. So we're busy working both in Australia, New Zealand and also with our international partners that you uh, can see there. Um, we've been set up to perform world-class collaborative industry focused research. Um, and this is absolutely, part of that and you can see several salmon companies are represented um, among our participants. So as I said today's webinar is understanding and improving salmon performance. The webinar will focus on salmon aquaculture R&D programs and I'm really pleased to be able to um, welcome our guests today who have fantastic experience uh, around um, those programs. So I think I'd like to um, introduce the first of our speakers, Professor Dan McQueen. Um, Dan is current, has a, uh, currently holds a personal chair in integrative fish genomics at the Roslyn Institute, University of Edinburgh, and he is the uh, leader of the division of genome biology there. And he's going to today talk about. Um, if we could put the title on. We'll just get our AV happening. So we can share screens now. All right. Apologies, might be a moment. So Dan's presentation will be harnessing single cell transcriptomics to understand and improve uh, salmon performance and health. So Dan, over to you. Great, uh, thanks very much, Chris. Can you see and hear me okay? Yes. yes. Excellent, all right. Well, hello to everyone. Um, so it's a pleasure to speak at this workshop, um, barring the fact that it's uh, only 7 a.m. here in the, in the UK and I, I haven't fully woken up. Um, so I'm going to get straight into things in the uh, interest of time. So if we can move to the next slide, please. Thank you. So if you're, if you're not familiar with the Roslyn Institute, it's a, a leading UK uh, centre for research into animal genetics and health uh, based on the University of Edinburgh's uh, vet school at the uh, Easter Bush campus, which has the beautiful Pentland uh, Hills in the, the backdrop. If you go to the next slide, please. So at the Roslyn Institute, aquaculture is an area of current strength. We have five research groups that are incorporating about 30 researchers currently working on diverse fish and uh, shellfish species as a major focus on salmonids and Atlantic salmon. Uh, but we have a range of different projects. Um, we've recently appointed uh, Nick Wade from CSIRO on uh, your side, and we're hoping to foster improved links with uh, Australian aquaculture research through Nick. I'm not going to read everything off this um, slide, so if we could just uh, carry on, please. So today I'm going to talk a little bit about single cell transcriptomics, uh, advocating this as a, a sort of fairly new tool that has potential to make major impacts on how we understand uh, traits involved in salmon performance. So the obvious backdrop to this is the all-time high demand 
uh, for increased sustainability in the industry um, through imp improving the performance and health. And that obviously requires scientific innovation. Um, and I'm planning to highlight just some data and projects in this brief um, webinar from my group. Um, and I'll just start before that with some quick uh, introduction, if we could move to the next slide. So those working in um, genomics or omics space will know that bulk transcriptomics, where we sequence um, whole uh, samples or tissues, is a, a great tool for studying gene expression phenotypes. But um, this method lacks scope to capture readouts from individual cells um, in an animal, say. Um, and as different phenotypes ultimately result from the actions and the interactions of different cell types, having expression, gene expression data that's resolved to the level of single cell types, including rare cells that may be having a particularly important role in, in, in tissues, provides a, a big step up in information when we're thinking about uh, getting to the genomic and functional basis for phenotypes. Uh, next slide, please. So this approach, single cell transcriptomics, has been making um, major advances already in the cellular biology of model organisms, where already um, detailed molecular profiles are available for comprehensive panels of cell types and states. And much of that data is available in online resources, allowing researchers to explore the cell-specific expression of their favorite genes or molecular pathways. Can we go to the next slide, please? So the aquaculture research community is already using single cell transcriptomics quite widely. Uh, the last time I looked, there were more than 20 papers that have been published spanning diverse species and tissues and cell types, um, with a particular focus on immunology to date. But I would say that the, the work that's been published to date is really scratching at the surface of what there is uh, left to learn. Because what we know about cellular diversity and its functional significance is very limited in even the best studied aquaculture species like salmonids and Atlantic salmon. And I'm really, I'm quite sure that single cell methods um, are going to help us make really big strides forward in understanding and exploiting cell biology in aquaculture species in the, the next few years. And you can see there at the bottom, um, my group recently had a review published that uh, will be a good read for those who are interested in finding out uh, a bit more detail about, about this uh, area. Go to the next slide, please. I'm just gonna say a little bit about what single cell transcriptomics is. So several methods are available. The most popular methods use microfluidics where cells or nuclei are sort of uh, disassociated from the tissues they come from and then captured in oil droplets alongside beads. And those beads have uh, capture RNA, if you could just move to the next animation, please, of capture RNA and also have a unique uh, barcode. Um, and this forms the structure of a sequencing library that allows each cell or, or nuclei um, and all the, the, the transcripts or gene expression that comes from that to be grouped according to a shared barcode, which is shared by all molecules in that droplet. Um, and the most commonly used commercial method is um, a company called Tenex Genomics, but the market is abound currently with different approaches. This is a fast moving area. If you could just move to the next animation. Um, and several of these methods aren't based on microfluidics and the method called past biosciences, for example, is a, a fairly new one that my group's using with really great results, some of which um, I'll be able to share briefly later. If we could move to the next slide, please. So I'll, I'll now um, present some data from my group where we've used single cell uh, transcriptomics in a number of studies to investigate the cellular base for health and performance traits in Atlantic salmon. I'll just start with a study where we used single nuclei sequencing um, of, of a, a bunch of tissues that were selected for their importance to immunological function and, and health. So our goal here was to generate some of the first atlases for, for Atlantic salmon of cells and to start to understand cell specific responses to immunological um, perturbation. So specifically in this study, a, a bacterial infection with Eremonas. 
And um, Richard Taylor and Rosa Rees Daniels have been crucial to this um, particular experiment where uh, the fish, as mentioned, were challenged with Eremonus or PBS as a control. And then if you could just go to the next animation, please. And the next one after that. Uh, so the nuclei were isolated from the tissues and we made single nuclei transcriptome libraries, which were then sequenced. You could go to the next slide. The sequencing data was then used in a range of analysis steps that I'm not going to go into. I don't really have time to explain, uh, but ultimately leading to sensible data and visualizations like that on the right. Um, this is a map of um, the different cells in the Atlantic salmon spleen derived from the data where you can see the different types of immune cells, for example. You could move to the next slide, please. So the first study I'll just mention focused on the liver. Um, the, uh, the major liver cell types here were um, clustered, as you can see on this map on the left, um, and then annotated using genes that were known to be good markers of the, the main liver cell types that we know should exist in, in all vertebrates. And you can you can see on the plot on the left, we mainly have hepatocytes um, in the red, but also four other cell types that we know should be in the liver. So the cholangiocytes, the mesenchyme cells, the endothelia, and um, a bunch of different immune cells. If you could move to the next slide, please. So then we can generate plots like this heat map um, and associated violin plots for genes of interest effectively show that our definition of these different cells in our data have um, their own specific uh, gene markers according to uh, differential expression tests that effectively um, the, the aim is to confirm the annotations that you've made of a particular cell type uh, using the predefined markers. If you could move to the next slide please. So then what we'd normally want to do is to hone in on, on particular cell types of interest. So shown here is a, a bit more focus on the hepatocytes, which are a, have a key role in metabolism, growth, um, and immunological function, making them a really uh, interesting and important cell type overall for salmon performance. So we identified nine different distinct hepatocyte clusters, um, including four dominant ones that you can see in the middle called H1 to H4. And you can see on the right there of the slide that the, these um, hepatocytes were highly biased in number according to the infection status. So for example, H3, 4, and 5 are much more prevalent in the um, infected samples. If you could just pop to the next slide, please. So in this um, study, several lines of evidence pointed to these four main clusters um, actually being a single type of hepatocyte, but that was in a distinct state that depended on the infection. So at one extreme for cluster H1, the transcriptome is being tasked to just pro-metabolic uh, functions. Um, but at the other end in the cluster 4, the hepatocytes have um, reshaped or remodeled their transcriptomes quite dramatically, simplified the genes they're expressing expressing and downregulated metabolism in favor of um, host defense functions, driving um, a release of um, acute phase proteins into the blood, which helps the fish clear out the infection. And there's more information in the paper if you shown at the bottom if you'd like to know more details. If you could move to the next slide, please. <clears throat> so we, we've also been characterizing uh, other tissues like the spleen and the head kidney, which are uh, important tissues to understand disease resistance phenotypes, um, because they're the, some of the dominant sites where immune cells develop or interact with uh, antigens. And I'll show some data for the spleen here. My PhD student, Chen Xuan, uh, is, is leading this work in my group and has identified uh, all the main types of immune cells that you'd expect to find, um, things like T and B lymphocytes, natural killer cells, macrophages, neutrophils, um, according to the, the marker gene expression that's shown on the violin plot on the right. If you could go to the next slide, please. Uh, and again, 
Thank you. So Jan Duran has identified further subpopulations of immune cells. So for example, there's some data shown here for the B cells, uh, which are important in the adaptive immune response and the, the cells that ultimately generate antibodies to antigens that come from um, pathogens or, or vaccines. Um, and you can see, for example, on the right that we have plasma cells, which are ultimately releasing the antibodies. Um, if you go to the next slide, please. Or on this slide, um, this is a more focused analysis of T lymphocyte cells, <coughs> excuse me, which are again important for adaptive immune response. And they're expected to be highly heterogeneous um, and have diverse functions that are performed by different subpopulations. Um, and Zhang Zhuan captures extensive heterogeneity in the salmon spleen. Um, with evidence for diverse types of T cells, providing many new marker genes, which can actually empower future studies because the resolution that we get in this data is just completely um, revolutionary compared to what we might classically get using standard immunology approaches. If you could move to the next slide, please. So we're also using this technology quite extensively in other projects. Um, I'll just briefly mention a, a very interesting Norwegian project that's led by Eric Bergerhout at, at Nofema, based in Norway, where we're exploring the impact of embryonic temperature um, on health and performance later in salmon ontogeny. So Atlantic salmon have been reared at either four, six or eight degrees solely from fertilization to the eyed stage and then grown on at the same temperature uh, all those different groups uh, matching standard production conditions from there on. And these fish have been through a plethora of different experimental challenges to try and understand phenotypic differences that are caused solely by the early uh, temperature experience in the embryo. And then we're using omic methods to understand the basic mechanisms involved. And the, the idea here is that growing eggs at higher than natural temperatures while promoting growth early in life is actually impacting uh, salmon immunity and resilience phenotypes later. And there's already within this project evidence in support of this hypothesis. So for example, you can see uh, this data in this graph at the bottom where a Yersinia disease challenge experiment was done at the PAR stage. And you can see that the fish that were grown at the lower temperatures of four and six survived better than the, the fish reared at eight degrees. And to understand the sort of developmental or functional basis for such impacts. My student, Carl, has been using single transcriptomics recently, using this other method, the pass, pass microfluidics free approach um, on the very early stage fish, initially a couple of months after first feeding. So basically fry. If you go to the next slide, please. So this uh, is a, a map of the cells in the, the liver of these uh, little fish. And you can see all the expected cell types are there. And you can see a big blob of uh, hepatocytes on the, the right, for example, and other cell types. Um, and just, just in case there is anyone here who's actually doing these sorts of methods, to point out that the data quality that we've got back with this method called PASS is um, really excellent. And actually the best uh, my, my lab has um, generated to date. If you could go to the next slide, please. So this is um, quite new data. Uh, that Carl is getting to grips with. Um, but there's some really interesting and clear signs already that the embryonic temperature regimes had a major impact on the cell-specific uh, gene expression phenotypes with genes affecting, um, really important genes affecting things like growth, metabolism, and immunity. So for example, these plots um, show some selected genes that have significant differential expression including genes from the uh, insulin-like growth factor growth hormone axis, which is a master regulator of growth um, in an endocrine context. And you can see on the left in hepatocytes that the IGF hormones show higher expression at the low temperature group, but lower expression of these molecules called IGF binding proteins um, that sequester the hormone from their receptor. And this is pointing to major differences in endocrine growth status. Also, several important immune genes show higher expression in the four-degree group two in the immune cells, like 
um, STAT1B, which is a transcription factor in T cells and also myeloid cells, and CD80, which is a, a molecule that activates um, adaptive immune response through T cells. Um, and overall, this is all also pointing to differences in immune status driven purely by embryonic temperature, which I think is very interesting. And we're doing more work on this now. Next slide, please. Thank you. So just quickly then, I finally wanted to point out that in another project funded by the BBSRC, we're using single cell transcriptomics to understand vaccine responses in Atlantic salmon. This is again using this PASS technology. Um, at this point, we've only done an initial trial to sequence the peripheral blood leukocytes after removing most of the, the red blood cells, which are nucleated in, in fish. Here you can see some data where we can identify the different immune cell types in salmon blood, along with this big blob of platelets. We're really excited about this project, as we're going to have um, extensive single cell data from multiple tissues and blood immune cells across a full vaccination time course against controls. And we're going to be able to cu couple that data to uh, immunological data on antibodies and pathology after disease challenge. And I, I can't really go into more details in the interest of time. Maybe we can move to the next slide, please. As a last point, I just wanted to promote um, a facility I'm leading that specializes in single cell sequencing. We're working with diverse um, species, including fish and shellfish. Obviously, Australia is very far away, but if you are ever interested in doing single cell sequencing with our facility, we can accommodate frozen samples and please just drop um, us an email. Um, if we could just go to the next slide, please. So just to wrap up very quickly, single cell um, genomics is an exciting method um, that can move forward to greatly our understanding of salmon health and performance traits. Um, I'm particularly excited about the fact that this technology allows us to get salmon specific cell biology. Um, so breaking the reliance on knowledge from model species, which we really do rely on in the sort of molecular biology world, is it provides a wealth of novel information that can help us build new toolboxes in our research for really um, getting at cell, cell biology specific uh, to this species as mentioned. Um, this review article contains a lot more information and, and I expect my lab will publish several more primary articles um, in this area in the coming year. You just go to my last slide, please. Um, so I'd just like to thank those in my group that did the work or, or others who contributed as collaborators and funding my group's single cell um, research to date. And thank you very much to the audience for listening. I'm sorry if I went a little over time. Thanks. Wonderful. Th thank you for a fascinating talk. And hopefully we'll have some questions at the end. So now we'll just do the tech transfer. And um, I shall introduce our next speaker once that happens. So it's my great pleasure to be able to introduce Dr. Jane Simmons from the Cawthorne Institute. She's a senior aquaculture scientist with a specialism in applied aquaculture R&D, genetics and biotechnology. Jane's going to talk today about multi-trait phenotyping of Chinook salmon to inform selective breeding. So thank you, Jane, and welcome. Thank you, Chris, and Kira, everyone. And can you hear and see my screen? OK. Hopefully you can. Yes, we can. OK. All right. So yeah, I'm going to talk about phenotyping um, Chinook or King Salmon um, to inform the breeding programs that we have in, in New Zealand. And thank you very much for um, inviting me to, to participate today. Much appreciated. Um, so just a, a bit of background if for anybody that doesn't know, but um, the main species farmed in New Zealand is um, Chinook Salmon, and it's farmed in the South Island of New Zealand. And um, farms span from the Marlborough Sounds at the top of the south right down to Rakiura, Stewart Island at the bottom. We have saltwater and freshwater grow out um, as well. And um, annual production is about 15,000 tonnes, predominantly all female. <clears throat> and there are three commercial breeding programmes that are in operation. So just to give you a bit of um, history, I mean, the, the species was introduced to New Zealand uh, in the 19... <laughs> late 1800s and early 1900s. And the summer farming was established. Originally, there was no um, selective breeding, but in the early 90s, um, <clears throat> one of the companies realized that they could make gains um, through family-based breeding and program was initiated, focusing mainly on growth. 
as things developed, um, the programs, um, another program was started and it was realized that there could be advantages by pooling families early and using DNA markers for parentage. And also um, the industry started to look at um, not selecting just for growth, but also other traits like um, quality. And then um, in um, the last decade, obviously with the advent of cheaper sequencing, um, the genotyping has moved towards using single nucleotide polymorphisms as the marker of choice, because you can have um, tens of thousands of them quite cheaply. And so we're now in the era um, of sort of um, combined pedigree and genomic selection and the number of traits that the industry wants to select and improve for is growing, especially um, as temperatures warm and um, the industry is interested in looking at thermal tolerance um, and um, climate change resilience. So that's probably something else we want to look at in the future as well as how do you make a resilient um, fish that can swim inshore and offshore if we move to higher energy sites. And also there are, I guess, within climate change, increasing risks of emerging pathogens. So looking at disease resistance, which we haven't done to date. So just an outline of what the programs generally look like. Um, so um, there are two breeding programs that set up around 120 to 150 families. They're set up at the freshwater hatcheries. Um, the groups that can <clears throat> then get um, split into the freshwater environment where the broodstock are kept, and then groups go out to the marine commercial sea pens um, where they're evaluated and we get the commercial data, which is really critical for the selection. Um, they then get harvested and genotyped. And um, for one company, they also select broodstock directly from the sea pens and take them back to land. Um, in the meantime, the siblings and um, have been reared on fresh water and again, data is collected on those. And then all of that data is put together in sort of animal breeding models to do the genetic evaluation, um, look at how the relate, traits are related and inherited, generate economic breeding values, and then combine into a multi-trait index based on industry priorities. And then that's used to then select the next, um, the, the broodstock to, to create the next generation. So one of the big questions for, um, is, you know, what traits to select um, and growth has been a predominant, uh, been a focus in most aquaculture breeding programs globally. Um, but there are other things like quality attributes, like in salmon, obviously, um, fillet color is important. Um, and one of the things that you have to um, consider, of course, are, you know, are the traits of commercial priority? Can you measure them? Are they affordable to measure? Can you get accurate measurements? Are they likely to be inherited by the offspring? So what's the heritability? And also understanding the relationships between the traits. So for example, in most salmonids, we know if we select for growth, we also see a um, increase uh, in um, the fat and lipid content. Sometimes that's a good thing, but not always. So understanding those re relationships is critical. And then also when we combine the traits, we wanna understand the economic value so that we don't put too much emphasis on a trait that's got little economic value versus those that uh, are a priority and uh, worth more to the, to the company. Um, so with this in mind, um, my background is in genetics and I've been very interested in looking at how, as a researcher, I can help inform the breeding programs that the industry um, operate. Um, so I'm at the Cawthron and I've been there since 2015. And we were lucky to get a um, large research grant to um, a five-year program to kind of look at phenotyping salmon and understanding different traits. And the one that we were focused on was, was feed efficiency. And we built the Finfish Research Center. And this just shows the Cawthron Aquaculture Park, which is about half an hour from Nelson, which opened in, in 2018. And the FRC is just um, highlighted there with, a, with an arrow. So the FRC was a facility that was designed with family phenotyping in mind, um, thinking that we needed enough volume and enough tanks to be able to evaluate you know, thousands of fish for the different phenotypes we wanted to evaluate. So we have 18, 8,000 litre tanks and also a smaller system with 3,000 litre tanks. We wanted to have really good environmental control. We wanted to be able to work in freshwater and saltwater space. So we've got six res systems with temperature control. We've also got uh, a lot of equipment, uh, a dry lab, swim flumes for looking at terrestrial and swimming tests, 
and also a portable digital unit so that we can look at um, skeletal health and also feed intake. So this on the right just shows the team um, crowding fish, netting them out, anesthetizing them, and then collecting the data, and then just some of our team in, in the lab collecting lots of samples. So we have a pipeline for family phenotyping um, that we use. And um, <clears throat> what happens is that we, we work closely with the two um, companies, Sanford and New Zealand King Salmon Company, who um, generously provide us with their pedigree populations for our research. So we go to the hatcheries and tag and genotype those. We then bring in those families and we're usually working with about three to 4,000 fish to the start of one of these trials, which can take, um, you know, be done over a period of about 12, 12 months. Because they're tagged, we then collect, can collect repeated measures uh, of the same fish over time. So that gives us a good idea of growth variability and performance. Um, along the way, we do cull some fish to reduce biomass, and, but also collect a lot of health data on those fish and also importantly, um, quality and composition data. And the one thing, because we're interested in the question around feed efficiency is that we um, also look at individual feed intake. And I'll talk about how we do that in a minute. Because one of our aims is really, I think like all of the industry is efficient use of feed resources, given that feed is expensive. We've also got questions about how to adapt to climate change and thermal tolerance. Um, we have an issue with spinal curvature in some, um, in some occasions in some farms. So we're interested in what, um, um, how to improve that. And one of the future things is looking at if you're running a breeding program, how much do you have to consider the different environments where the fish are farmed? And that's potentially um, very relevant to, to moving um, to higher energy sites or uh, an offshore and are the fish that we've been breeding now, do they still perform well in a high energy environment? So through this pipeline, um, we've, we've evaluated many, many traits and looked at um, family performance. Um, so our, uh, our um, portable digital x-radiography setup, just shows an example here, has been really useful in looking at skeletal health because we do have that um, spinal curvature that happens. And we can um, put this into our process of uh, data collection and, um, and use, use this on live fish quite easily. And on the right, we just shows a x-ray of um, a fish, the same fish throughout a trial. And you can see the curvature is a late onset curvature. And over time, it progressively gets gets worse in the fish. So that's something that we've been interested in evaluating and looking at the genetics of. At the same time, our aim was to um, assess feed efficiency. And actually, in analyzing individual feed intake in fish is um, quite a challenge. Um, we wanted to be able to do it in, um, you know, with commercial numbers at commercial densities. Uh, we didn't want to be indiv individually videoing individual fish because we're talking about thousands of fish here. So we use the Ballatini feed method, which is basically where you incorporate an X-ray opaque bead into the diet. You then, um, <coughs> at a single meal, feed that feed to the fish. Um, you can then anesthetize the fish and X-ray the fish. Um, and then, as you can see on the right, there's an image of a fish with the pellets in the stomach, and you can quite clearly clearly see the white beads. Um, we've then got some um, semi-automated software that counts those beads. We have a calibration curve that relates bead numbers to the amount eaten. And so from that, we can get the feed intake of that fish and we can generate that, like I said, on three, 4,000 fish in one of our assessments. So then obviously we can look at this, we do repeated measures of this on the same fish. And so, and we can measure the weight so we can work out the individual FCR for that fish by looking at its individual feed intake over its weight gain. So we've done that in several trials and we have found consistent results. One of the challenges in um, farming king salmon is that they do have highly variable FCR and it is higher than other salmoners such as Chinook salmon. So commercial FCR may be around 1.8 to 2 um, in the whole of life. So it is something that has been identified as a priority by the industry to improve. So we're very much interested in what does the family variation look like in this trait? And the first trial we did, um, the, F the mean FCR of family ranged from about 0.9 to about 1.6, which is a huge difference. Um, and we've then repeated that in a, in a completely different um, cohort of 
of fish in a second trial and found we got the same um, kind of distribution. So there's obviously some families that are a lot more feed efficient than others. And what we did find is that the, the inefficient fish, that we call them, tend to be the ones that eat large, larger meals, but don't um, have as efficient nutrient retention. Uh, so that's interesting that we, we believe that there's some component of um, behavior and overeating that's also um, driving this phenotype in these fish. Um, so heritability um, of FCR tends to be low. And in our trials, it's ranged from about 0.4 to point, about 0.2. So about 14 to 20% of the variation is due to genetics. We've done some cost benefit analysis. So we've, we've estimated how much it costs us to do this analysis in our trial, and then look at what benefits you might be gaining um, for a company um, even given the, the low to, um, to moderate heritability. And it does come out um, showing that it is worth it if that's, if that's a priority. Given that, we're very much interested in how all of these traits are related to each other. Um, so we, what we have here is a classic table that's the, of the genetic parameters. Uh, weight, WT is the weight, we've got condition factor, specific growth rate, um, FCR and LKS, which is lordosis, kyphosis, scoliosis, um, spinal curvature. So the weight and condition factor have high heritability, um, growth and spinal curvature is moderate and feed intake and FCR in this particular example is um, lowish. Good news is that we did find a favorable um, genetic correlation with growth in FCR. So you can in theory, improve um, growth by uh, FCR by improving for growth. Although the benefits, you will get more benefit if you do measure it um, directly. Um, on the bottom of the diagonal, we're looking at the genetic correlations. So what we like to know is, you know, like I say, if you if you breed for one trait, what's the change in another going um, going to be? We did find in our tank experiments that there was an unfavorable correlation between condition factor and spinal curvature. Of 0.44, so which means if you have a fish that's got a higher condition factor, which is the ratio of, of le length to weight, um, weight to length, then, then those fish with a higher condition factor would be more likely to develop spinal curvature. So that's been quite a, a major a finding for, for us. So recently, we've developed a challenge model where we can look at thermal tolerance in the families as, a, as a, another phenotype, and we've been working with the New Zealand King Salmon Company. We've been evaluating um, 130 families. They're all tagged. Um, they come into our facility. They get distributed into our nine tanks, and then using our um, temperature control system, we can then manipulate temperature and look at um, mortality over time. When we did that, um, we um, basically ran the trial over 50 days. And over that time, we got 60.6% .6 mortality. Our target was 50 to 60% as an endpoint. Um, on the top right, you can see the, the date and the orange line is the temperature and at the bottom is the cumulative mortality. What we found was that in, until we reached about 22, 22 and a half, we had very little mortality. But once we reached 23, 23 and a half, mortality significantly increased. On the other hand, we started to see a depression in feed intake, which is the bottom left chart. And feed intake started to decline at around 19 degrees. And then by the end of the trial at 23 and a half, some fish were still feeding and were alive, which were very resilient individuals. But on the whole, feed intake was, um, was very low at that point. We then worked with um, <coughs> the genetics company Select to crunch the data. Um, we can see the survival curves on the right, just some example families. Um, so again, we see lots of um, family variations. So one family had um, over 93% survival, whereas others had 100% um, survival. And you can see that the time to death was quite different between the families. We looked at two traits, um, simply the dead or alive or time to death. And we found that time to death, 34% of the variation in that was um, due to genetics. So that's significant with a lot of potential for um, selection in that trait. And we also found that the traits were highly correlated and the accuracy of the trait selection is, is good. We're also interested um, in looking at environmental interactions, like I said, so we've set up a swim uh, swim trial with our Blue Economy uh, funded um, PhD student um, Letitia Prescott, 
And so we've been looking at different flow re regimes and we're interested in how the families perform um, under different conditions. So that's a work in progress, but I think you know we want to really understand if you if um, fish are subjected to a, a higher current, what effect does that have on that performance? Um, so finally, as well, we're also very interested when we're doing tank trials. Um, we get asked a lot and we think about it a lot. Does the data that we get in our tanks, is it relevant to commercial performance in the sea pens? Because that's quite a critical question. We're analyzing that at the moment with King Salmon for the for the um, temperature tolerance by looking at the same families in the sea pens. But we do have a data set that we worked with um, Sanford's to look at the same the same traits in our tanks and the same traits in their sea pens for the same families. And we did find, in fact, that they were genetically correlated. Um, heritabilities were similar, and um, the genetic correlation is bottom is on the bottom right. And you can see, for example, fillet fat. Um, was highly correlated in the two environments. So we are um, confident that, that there are differences, but generally um, the correlations are good and the same families that do well in a sea pen um, also do well in our, our tanks. But again, for thermal tolerance, we still really need to test that, which is one of our goals. So it's good to see that we can phenotype in tanks and give the industry relevant data because some traits you know, like feed intake, you cannot be measuring it at the sea pen. Um, we've evaluated close to 300 families, we've genotyped over 8,000 8, fish, and we've looked over time at at least 50 different traits. Um, we've shown the potential for um, selection for feed efficiency and thermal tolerance, and uncovered uh, unfavorable genetic correlations, which information we've very passed on to the industry and we work very closely with, with the farmers. Um, so yeah, so this was a, a, a work of many, as so I have to acknowledge a lot, I'll acknowledge the fish, huh? but also the team at Cawthron, um, our collaborators at Ag Research who do the genotyping um, help with the analysis. A big thank you to our industry partners, King, New Zealand King Salmon Company in Sanford, and also for Select for um, helping with the genetic analysis on the thermal tolerance. And a very big thank you too to the Ministry of Business and Innovation and Employment for the funding we had for our salmon program and also MPI for funding our um, thermal tolerance trial. Um, so thank you very much. Wonderful, thank you. And uh, nice to see the kind of convergence and links um, between what you're doing and what's happening in Tasmania. So that leads nicely into our next speaker. So. Lewis Rand is the Selective Breeding Program Manager for Soltas, which is the um, industry program for that, but I'll, I'll let Lewis um, explain that. And Lewis is, is going to talk about the Tasmania Atlantic Salmon Selective Breeding Program, Origin Developments and Innovation. So thank you, Lewis. Thanks very much, Chris. And uh, yeah, great talk so far, uh, Jane and Dan. So I'm, yeah, I'm talking about understanding and improving salmon performance in the context of the Tasmanian Atlantic Salmon Selective Breeding Program. Um, as Chris said, I'm the Selective Breeding Program Manager at Saltas. Start, start with the beginning, what is Saltas? Uh, Tasmania's major producer of eggs and smolt. And the owner operator of the Cooperative Selective Breeding Program for the Tasmanian industry. So our, our main role as a breeding organization is to drive strategic sustainable improvement in salmon performance. Salmon performance is undoubtedly a combination of many factors, um, including genetics, nutrition, and health. You know, having excellent genetics uh, means very little with poor health or nutrition uh, and, and, and excellent nutrition and excellent health will not result in a highly performing fish without the right genetics. So all three of these things have to be in order for, um, for excellent performance in the salmon. But what, what is the role of genetics in performance? Do they significantly influence performance? Just a bit of background on our breeding program. We track the performance of hundreds of families in commercial production traits, uh, including weight and disease resistance, summer growth, fillet quality and maturation rate. When we are looking at those at the data uh, for these traits, we're trying to answer the big questions in selective breeding. You know, is, is there a difference in family performance for the traits that we're interested in? What is the relationship between them? And then what gains can we make 
in all of these traits without compromising on genetic diversity. So this graphic here shows uh, each dot is a different one of the families that we've tested in our most recent marine trial. The horizontal axis there is the family weight, plus or minus the mean. And the, the vertical axis is the family's amoebic gill disease resistance, where a higher number is better. You can see there that genetic, so all of these fish were part of the same trial. They were all incubated in the same hatchery, fed the same diet, uh, grown in the same pen together. So the difference between these in performance is due to the genetics. And we can see there that there is a, you know, almost a two kilo swing between some of our highest growing families and some of our lowest growing families and a very significant difference in maybe gill disease resistance. The other thing to take out of this is that there is no correlation between these two traits. So we could put our foot on the floor and go for growth as hard as we can, but we wouldn't make any improvement in amoebic gill disease and vice versa. And that's why it's important to understand, is there variation? And then what is the relationship between the traits? And for interest, the dots there that I've highlighted in blue are the fish, are the families that will be used or have been used as broodstock for the next year class. So in general, these are about 10% larger and about 10% more AGD resistance. And those gains are the source of our improvement year on year. Why didn't we just pick all the ones in the top right hand corner? Uh, there's a lot of other factors, including our other traits and genetic diversity, which we have to consider when we're making our selections. So what will I cover? Uh, looking at the Saltas breeding program before the integration of omics, particularly genomic selection. The process of that implementation, why, how, and the, and the so what. Then how this implementation has advanced to maximize commercial performance. We think that we've got some really creative solutions to the problems um, that, cut, that our industry faces. And I'd like to spend a couple of minutes talking about our R&D opportunities too before omics integration. The early years of the selective breeding program um, are really well covered um, in a couple of different papers. But as a quick summary, 400,000 eggs came from Canada to New South Wales in the 60s. They came from New South Wales to Saltas in the 80s. From there, there was a strategy to not select, to not, not pick out the biggest fish or the best looking fish to try and maintain as much genetic diversity as possible. And a study in 1999 showed that that had been relatively successful. At this point, that was the information needed to say, maybe there is enough genetic diversity to start a, a selective breeding program. And the demand from the industry for a breeding program was due to amoebic gill disease as a response to amoebic gill disease. So amoebic gill disease is the white plaque on the gills there, the mucus plaques on the gills. This occurs in salt water. Uh, treated by freshwater bathing but due to the frequency the amount of freshwater needed and the scale of the industry the demands on freshwater infrastructure and manpower were absolutely enormous in addition to the treatment the growth loss and mortality that's associated with this disease led to an increased cost of production by of approximately 20 percent so before omix was implemented Gains for, for growth and maybe gill disease resistance were very respectable at 3% per year, approximately 10% gen, per generation, which is, is very good while maintaining low levels of inbreeding. Those are the gains in the, the nucleus of the breeding program and commercial production was done using brood stock that come from a pool from the top families each year. Quite uniquely, uh, especially at the time, this breeding program used DNA testing uh, for pedigree assignments. So there was widespread spread genotyping rather than raising families in individual family tanks to keep track of who's who, there was genotyping and tagging. It's important to keep in mind that the Saltas Selective Breeding Program cannot take candidates from the ocean back to the hatchery to breed for biosecurity. And therefore to make informed, reasonable decisions, we must use their relatives as sources of information. So prior to omics, using family-based selection, fish from every all of our new families each year were split. Some were sent to a human marine test site, 
some were sent to a Tazsal marine test site, and others from those families were kept in freshwater taxed as broodstock. So it would not just be their siblings that informed um, informed our selection decisions, but their half siblings, their aunts, and their grandparents, all the way through the family tree, all the way through the pedigree. So this data was used to produce breeding values for our broodstock. Breeding values are a predictor of how good of a parent will you be. As I said, that data comes from the pedigree, not just the siblings, but the whole range. And this is a, a, a good example of classical selective breeding. Here's a graphical representation of our cycle. We've got approximately a three year generation interval from first hatching to being used as a broodstock. Families are made each year. We make 240 families now from 120 males and 120 females. At about one year of age, a large pool of these fish are DNA tested and pedigreed. We send some out to the marine, um, marine grow out in the test pens, and then the rest are kept in freshwater and grow out. There's frequent measurements uh, in freshwater and marine environments, and these lead to genetic evaluation and selection. If you're interested in reading more about the program, prior to omics integration, there's a great uh, conference talk, um, conference publication by uh, Nick Elliott and Peter Kirby from 2009. So the implementation of omics, particularly genomic selection, how, why, so what? So this is very similar to the, graph, uh, the um, slide that I had previously. Now with the addition of genomic data, enabling genomic selection. This means that not only are we looking for the best uh, families each year, but we're actually even looking for the best individuals. This is a very modern breeding approach. So omics genomics, we're using the DNA fingerprint of every one of our individuals. These fish that are sent to the seaside or kept as broodstock in freshwater are all tested on 50,000 DNA markers. And all of these are slightly bad or slightly good. Why do we care about the individual DNA fingerprint though? Well, you might get a random half of your mum and your dad's DNA. So it's conceivable that one fish might get all of mum and dad's best genes while their sibling gets the worst of both. So some siblings are certainly better than others. I have to emphasize this is so we can choose the best individuals based on their unique genetic makeup, progressing away from just family selection. So this is a, a, a chart that I'll step through and, and it describes the benefit of, of genomic selection. On the horizontal axis there is our breeding galleys before the addition of genomic data. And on the vertical axis is the genomic estimated breeding values, which are more accurate with this extra genomic information. So this is the middle of the population at uh, say 22 to 23%. This, these fish were all thought to be similar quality uh, for amoebic gill disease resistance. With the addition of genomic data, it was revealed, the extra accuracy helped to show that there was actually a range from 8% to 50% genetic gain. So there was actually an enormous range within this middle part of the population that was previously not able to be accessed using family-based breeding. This is a group of fish all from one family. This whole family was estimated to have a 34% uh, improvement in amoebic gill disease resistant before genomic data. And the addition of genomic data actually revealed a range from 25 to 44%. So given the range in the whole population, we were actually able to show with genomics that the range within a family is almost as large as the variation between families. And this was previously lost without genomic data. How is this done? To implement genomics, you need a certain set of tools. We needed high density, genome wide coverage, informative markers, and we are using SNP markers for this. Because the Tasmanian population is slightly unique from other North American salmon due to the um, 60 years of, of um, separation, we had to collaborate with Centre for Aquaculture Technologies, a US-based business, to produce custom testing, custom 50K and 3K arrays, so 50,000 markers and 3,000 markers at specific price points. But what was really nice operationally was that 
although there was a lot happening behind the scenes with the data, the operations and the husbandry processes did not change. As I said before, we were already doing microchipping and genotyping for pedigree assignment. So now we're actually unlocking full use of that genomic data, that genetic data by using it for omics. And here is an updated version of the genomic selection salmon breeding cycle. You can see the shape is really the same, except now there's some additions where high density genotypes are collected on parents. Uh, the thin clips are now um, at one year of age, uh, collected as normal, but the analysis is really different. We're adding in more than 10,000 new genotypes every year, and now the production of genomic estimated breeding values um, happens multiple times a year as new information comes in. And so what? What were the benefits? One of the biggest drivers for implementation of genomics was amoebic gill disease resistance, and that's where we expected to see the most gains. And the gains did increase very significantly from 3 to 6% per year due to the increased prediction accuracy. But fortunately, there was an unexpected benefit of gains in the other traits. Harvest weight gains increased from about 3% to 5% per year, roughly equal to 15% per generation, which is extremely impressive. In fact, the gains were so high that we were able to introduce a new trait without sacrificing gains in these other primary traits, and that is summer growth. We've seen that periods of higher temperature over summer reduce growth, and in fact, the growth during this period is actually heritable and distinct from harvest weight. If you're interested in reading more about the process of the implementation of genomic selection, Verbala et al. have a publication from 2022 um, discussing the implementation in the SALTAS program. And now maximizing commercial performance using these advanced technologies. Genomic selection was first applied to the SBP nucleus and is now being applied to the commercial multipliers. So these are the brood stock that we use to produce all of our harvest fish. The nucleus has hundreds of families. From these hundreds of families every year, thousands of fish become commercial multipliers from the top families. And these fish produce millions of harvest fish. As I mentioned earlier, prior to genomics, those, fish, those eggs were pulled from high value families and then used blindly. Now with the implementation of genomics and the reduced price of genotyping, we collect tissue samples from around 10,000 male multipliers every year, only using the top 1,000, which is a very, very high selection intensity. We aren't really taking the best of the best. Every male can fertilize up to a million eggs. So the benefits of choosing the right fish for the job are absolutely enormous. It's complicated, however, because the different marine grow-out sites around Tasmania have very distinct environmental conditions and production takes place year round. So when we're sending uh, fish to sea, they, they may experience large variations in grow-out, season, temperature, or disease challenge. And it's very rarely just that the fish need to be bigger going to this site or more disease resistant at that time of year. There's a lot of relationships between all of these factors. Multi-trait requirements, for sure. Genomic selection allows us to identify the individuals with the ideal combination of traits for the specific marine grow-out environment and time. Here's some examples of the smolt and harvest profiles. So for example, a type one smolt might be going into the ocean in summer and being harvested the next summer. When we're selecting broodstock to fertilize eggs going to that site, we would put a higher emphasis on summer performance to make sure there was strong growth and color retention for the summer harvest. There's then two, type 2A and 2B smolt. These are smolt going into the sea in winter, being harvested the next winter. We would not be emphasizing summer performance as significantly. We would put more emphasis on growth and amoebic gill disease because the summer performance is less relevant. But even with the same input time and harvest time, fish going to a different site might have different requirements. And at, for a 2B smolt, they might have to have uh, more emphasis on summer performance due to higher average water temperatures. Then a type three smolt, smolt might be going to a zone with high amoebic gill disease burden. And we would really put all our emphasis or most of our emphasis on amoebic gill disease resistance. So that's how omics is allowing us to 
tackle the challenges of farming in Tasmania. And I'll now talk about just briefly a couple of our R&D projects. Soltaz, through our partners, through our uh, shareholders, Hewan and Tassel, is working with the Blue Economy CRC uh, on future-focused and innovative work that is taking place at uh, University of Tasmania um, at, at the IMAS facility. Uh, we are using families from the selective breeding program uh, in this absolutely world-class facility to collect performance data on conditions that we just cannot replicate anywhere else. The fish are grown in high temperature and low dissolved oxygen environments. And to us, when we designed this experiment, we wanted these fish to go through the summer of the future. We want to know, are our fish going to be performing in what we think the climate will look like? This experiment is still underway, but we're very, very excited about the results. So far, omics data has been collected on every fish on a genomic level and then proteomics on some. Very encouragingly, there are good correlations with our marine trial data. So some of the fish and some of the families that we would expect to grow well in our previous marine trials or in our current marine trials are growing really well at the EAS. This gives us some reassurance that the selections we're making now are actually climate proofing our fish. And my last content slide, other R&D that we're working on in the omics space is to allow the genomic selection of our female broodstock. I spoke quite a lot about genomics being used on our males because they can fertilize up to a million eggs. We're getting 10,000 eggs roughly per female. So the, the number that is being used is much, much larger. So a low cost option is essential. Soltes has recently worked in collaboration with CAT to develop a low density test at a lower price, which allows us to choose the best females for the job, just like the best males. And we think that this has a, uh, has a synergistic benefit, which is greater than the sum of the parts because not just are we improving the average, but by actually reducing the variation, taking out the smallest or most disease susceptible fish, maybe the super spreaders, we can significantly improve the population performance. From a breeder's perspective, this is also very exciting because now all of our commercial fish will come from a known pool of parents, which means that any commercial pen that we have access to will be able to be used for breeding program information. That's everything from me today. So thank you very much. Um, I especially want to thank uh, my, my company, Soltaz, our shareholders and, and supporters, Tazsal and Human Aquaculture, our scientific supporters, CSIRO and the Centre for Aquaculture Technologies. And I really need to acknowledge the Blue Economy and the University of Tasmania uh, regarding our uh, ongoing R&D interest. Thank you very much. Right, thank, thank you very much for that. Look back into the past and walk through and future view. Cheers, Chris. So now I'll just uh, get my screen happening. Okay, so this is the, the final Final talk in this in the sequence, and it's a, a nice link on from uh, Lewis's talk, and it's really just to introduce the blue economy, the blue economy R and D, and to talk about a specific project that we've got. So it's it's a bit of a multi ranging uh, walk and talk through some of the things that we're doing in in the blue economy. Um, really, just to focus on on the right hand side there and to explain what we're doing in salmon aquaculture. Salmon aquaculture, and it talk, it's a kind of legacy statement, salmon aquaculture in offshore high energy sites that is sustainable and allows industry a choice about where to farm salmon and a pathway for industry expansion and diversification. So that's a really important driver for the program that I lead in the blue economy and in relation to the um, salmon industries, not only in, in Tasmania, but, but also in New Zealand. Um, so I, I really just wanted to talk through some some of these things on on the slide here. Um, talk about a specific project that that Lewis has introduced, the experimental platform for aquaculture production or EPAP, and that's a, a kind of project that allows us to focus on salmon production biology, and focus in a way that looks at how it contributes to advancing offshore aquaculture in Tasmania, New Zealand. 
And it also supports the blue, blue economy R&D building blocks. So what we learn in salmon, and this is often the case, helps inform other, other aquaculture. So in the, just to keep moving quickly, um, just briefly talk about Tasmanian Atlantic salmon aquaculture for the members of the audience who aren't based in, in Tasmania. So most of aquaculture and a large part of Australian seafood originates with the Atlantic salmon aquaculture industry here. So in, in 2020, 55% of aquaculture by value and production um, it was due to the Atlantic salmon industry. Um, there's been changes uh, in the industry, international acquisition of Tasmania's two largest companies. So I think that is a way that allows us to have an impact that extends out of Tasmania in, in terms of the kind of R&D that we could do and contribute. But so that's a kind of exciting change in the, the international environment. Um, the blue economy has been uh, very much involved in looking at Tasmania's future aquaculture and through a lot of work and uh, various um, communication symposia and things, the Blue Economy released what was called the Blue Economy CRC Am Ambition Aquaculture in, over in November 2022. So that really um, captured a lot of the thinking and, and diverse thinking around where we're going in terms of, of aquaculture. And part of that larger process then was that the state government has recently re released its Tasmanian Salmon Industry Plan. 2023. So that was released last month. What I wanted to focus on was, was the production biology challenges. So you can see those and it, they kind of relate very strongly to the traits that have been selected for. So suboptimum summer conditions, managing environmental impacts and managing amoebic gill disease. So all of those things have been talked about. I, I particularly wanted to talk about production biology challenge in relation to climate change. And as we're all aware, the kind of climate change impacts are very much around kind of heating up um, both in Australia and Tasmania. And interestingly, I've just, just actually put two slides that I presented five years ago at a second international symposium on offshore aquaculture. And, you know, there the heating up was about environment change, climate change, um, particularly in Tasmania, which is a climate change hotspot. Um, there's challenges to do with new species moving southwards. So are they invasive? Are they part of our new future environment? Um, but, but, but also there was issues around, you know, politicization around fisheries and aquaculture, uh, limited coastal locations and the need for expansion of the industry and all of those things resonate now. And, and part, of, part of that was kind of challenges and responses, which, which haven't changed significantly to what was being presented there in, in, the, in, in the right hand side of those. And in many ways, this move to offshore becomes even more important. Um, so in terms of, of how we're thinking about salmon, and this is coming at it from a physiology first, and then um, working with the selective breeding program after that, it, in a sense, it's, it's all captured by the stresses that are imposed by the environment that the fish are in. And that's, of course, known to all of us. But the, the reason why I put this slide up was to say that Really, in Tasmania, the, the focus around suboptimum conditions has been focused on suboptimum summer conditions. And it's really about this temperature up, oxygen down um, conditions that the, the fish have to face. And in terms of looking to the future, you know, consideration about um, offshore environments is, a, is, is, is just in the background. So most of the focus has, has been on that. And for that very reason, um, in the early 2010s, um, there was a lot of discussion about um, providing an industry applicable research facility. So um, it, it, this is why I've put up a slide about the experimental aquaculture facility, just to give a bit of a background to that, because it was very much developed with industry in mind to uh, 
provide a facility that addressed industry issues. And those issues were around, you know, potential climate change being one of them. And the other, the other one was amoebic ill disease. So all of this was developed in 2010. Um, in 2014, a partnership was developed, and that partnership was between University of Tasmania, Scretting, and Hewitt Aquaculture. So we're all equal partners in the experimental aquaculture facility. And you can see some slides of it there. One of the conditions of the build was we weren't allowed to build a new building, so we had to renovate old buildings. Nevertheless, it's been a, an extremely uh, interesting journey, but we have produced a facility that is very fit for task in the sense that we can grow salmon in seawater. We can control the environmental conditions at the moment, principally to elevate the temperature and to some extent decrease the dissolved oxygen. But we can grow these fish at rates that make sense and we can grow them to a size that um, allows us to look at commercially relevant data. So we can grow them up to uh, you know, four or five kilograms. And that provides us with a tremendous research opportunity. And I'll leave this, I won't dwell on this slide. I'll, I'll keep this in the pack for people to look at if they wish to at a later date. But, but where I wanted to get to is it, it presents a tremendous opportunity in terms of us being able to work with, with the selected breeding program um, supported by the Blue Economy CRC to actually bring a, through a few threads together. And before I, I talk about that in a bit more detail, I did also want to just say that the Blue Economy um, is supporting a lot of salmon aquaculture R&D, um, both kind of direct but also indirect projects and, and right across um, engineering, renewable energy, production biology, um, environment and kind of governments and and the create, creation of social and cultural license to operate. So just some of the projects there. And um, of course, I'm, I'm selling the blue economy, but it's important that I do that because it's becoming a major supporter of, of the salmon industry. And one of the ways it's done that is through this project that I just want to quickly introduce to you. So EPAP, the Experimental Platform for Aquaculture Production. We've really only been going for six or seven months. So it's very much just uh, an initial look at what we're doing. And what underlies it, as you can see, is, of course, uh, an aim to support development of offshore Tasmanian aquaculture. Um, we want to use a translational experimental approach to address critical knowledge gaps in salmon production biology. And to do this, we have to work closely with industry partners. And those partners include SOLTAS and the uh, Tasmanian Selective Breeding Program. So that's really what's reflected by that axis shown at the top, which I'll dissect a bit in the next few slides. And it's all to ensure that, you know, successful outcomes will come, you know, will come from understanding how to relate differences in salmon performance to both the underlying physical physiological mechanisms, um, but be able to do that across experimental and commercial systems. And those of course include offshore systems. So this in a way captures what um, Lewis has been talking about, the kind of translational approach between a, a test marine cage to a commercial situation. So I won't dwell on that because Lewis has gone through that in, in great detail. This slide is, is put up just to show you our research paradigm, if you like, and, and you've seen that reflected in other talks. And it definitely emphasizes the importance to test the fish under suboptimum summer conditions, but also to include a, an autumn recovery phase. So this is our first experiment. It was done indoors in the two and a half thousand liter tanks. You can see that in the experiment, we went through a period of raising the temperature. Um, we chose 19 degrees as a temperature that would impose a temperature stress on the fish. It would pull apart the families that we use from the selective breeding program, but it wouldn't result in, in uh, large scale uh, mortality. That's not what we were looking to do. Um, in addition to that, we um, put the oxygen down to around about 80% of the 100% uh, saturation. And we maintain those fish over a long 
long period of time, a summer equivalent time, and we then put them through a recovery period or a kind of autumn. So just, just in terms of the data that you see on the bottom of the figure there, that's monitoring every day's feed intake by the 12 tanks that were in the system. And it shows a nice reflection of the changing conditions. And it's a useful data set for us to be able to start to understand, even at that level, the impact of, of these environmental conditions. But what we really wanted to do was deep dive into the um, you know, fundamental mechanisms that are, are driving differences in these families. So to do that, we, we had an analysis points. We looked at, of course, morphometrics, growth performance, digestive performance, um, and also adopt the approach of using omics technologies to kind of further dissect what might be those causes. So that gives us the kind of left left hand side where we're kind of linking the salmon that are exposed to these conditions in our tanks, understanding those, linking those to the same um, test net pens that, that Lewis talked about in the middle. And as he talked about already, we're getting a, an indication of kind of success in terms of being able to translate uh, information between those systems. And ultimately, this is what we're trying to do, of course, is for those characteristics that are not easily tested in the test net pens, we want to be able to use the EAF to inform our selective breeding program and go straight to the straight to the um, commercial aquaculture and ultimately straight to the offshore um, situation that we're interested to investigate. So just to explain briefly the paradigm that we're using, it, it's really to have a look at low, middle and high performing fa um, fish to test whether we can actually look at that at a kind of family level, if we can do that resolution and we'll investigate using omics changes to the proteome, transcriptome, metabolome and, and also to some other um, biological factors. So that, that's our basic construct at the moment. One of the outcomes that we're really keen to do is establish a toolbox that allows us to relate this information to the test site that the blue economy is developing. So this test site is the Bass Strait Aquaculture Research Trial Site. Um, a lot of work has been done by the Blue Economy um, team to establish this research trial site north of north of Devonport. Um, and we've provided, or well, the team, Richard, um, uh, have provided plenty of information on this. What I wanted to do was just set it in the context of what we're doing in EPAP and the toolbox. So we will have, hopefully, experimental um, salmon aquaculture going on in, in this location. And this is how we're going to relate what we've been doing to that much bigger and important program. So you can see that in developing that um, trial site, there is absolute consideration in terms of site characteristics, the blue economy values, making sure that it conforms to those around trans transparency, sustainability, um, social license, cultural license, et cetera. Um, making sure that we've got the infrastructure and part of what the blue economy is doing is, is building and developing that infrastructure. But our role is to understand fish biology and develop the toolbox. So as you can see on the left, our EPAP program will be able to develop our toolbox, understand how to use that toolbox, that will allow us to do some benchmarking of performance. And that also starts to talk about the welfare of the fish there. And basically we'll adopt this kind of, I put it in inverted commas, but the kind of biomarker approach to being able to do that. And the feedback of course, is that at some stage, hopefully we will be able to inform the selective breeding program around that. And those four, um, photos on the right there are really this kind of mesh between um, our on-land experimental facility, the test cages, the coastal cages, and then all those um, waves and things to signify at some stage, 
uh, we will be hoping to inform offshore aquaculture and selected breeding traits for offshore aquaculture. So basically just to wrap up quickly then, the, the, the Tasmanian salmon um, industry is certainly investigating offshore aquaculture in, in, in Tasmania, Australia. I say Australia because it's strictly speaking in Commonwealth waters. Uh, at this stage, we're developing a trial site to be able to do this and so, you know, making sure that we've done the background R&D to support um, the experiments that go there. So the, the EPAC project absolutely is being set up to do that as one, as the, as one of the outcomes. Um, as I've talked about and as Lewis talked about before me, um, already we feel that we are making an impact and providing outcomes for the selective breeding program that can be translated into um, use in the current coastal aquaculture. So that pretty much is me wrapping up. Of course, many acknowledgements, um, particularly those members of the industry that have been involved in the background for a long time in setting up the EPAP um, program. Also to recognise the Blue Economy team there, John Whittington, Irene Panasis and Angela in particular, Williamson in particular for, for their amazing work in developing all of that that was needed to um, underpin that trial site and recognition of our partners. So thank you. Um, and what I'm going to do now is just um, hopefully quickly stop sharing and allow us to move into the Q&A session. So as part of the Q&A session, I'm, I'm hoping that um, Dr. Gianluca Amoroso, who is the IMAS EA, EAF fellow, will join us on, onto the panel. So hopefully, hopefully that will happen as I'm speaking. And what I'd like to do now is kind of um, get the speakers back so we can see them. And then uh, I thought I'd go and have a look at the questions and uh, pleased to see that we've got some in the Q&A and just uh, have a look at uh, what we've got. So I might kind of go to the, the top here. Um, that looks like a very, very specific question that um, Dan might wish to answer first. Dan, can you see the question there or do I need to read yeah, it out? Yeah, I can, I can, I can see it, Chris. Um, I think it is a specialised answer. I'll try it and be... Um quick about it. I actually clicked the wrong box. I clicked that I would type, but I, I can answer it live. So it's a really good question. It's not a simple answer. Yes, poor, the poor annotation of salmonid genomes is a big challenge because in um, these sorts of analyses, we really do rely on transferring knowledge about cell biology from well-characterized species like mammals, like human. And that's a, a problem for a, a lot of reasons. Some have different cell types or um, subpopulations that might not be characterized in other species. Um, that can be a problem. But even when cells are conserved across species, the, the marker genes can be different for biological reasons, for technical reasons. Um, we might not have power to detect them. They might not be annotated in the genome. Um, Salmonids also have complex genomes. They have many duplicated gene copies um, compared to, say, um, humans. Salmon can have four copies of a single human gene. These are usually very poorly annotated, but can be have different expression as well. And fundamentally, the annotation of genes is based on um, assumptions that don't really hold up. The functions of genes are conserved across species. Um, so annotation is a big problem. But with, with that said, it's easy to identify the major different cell types in um, salmon, which are quite well conserved across vertebrates. Um, there's enough marker genes available. The, the challenge comes when we want to get into more fine-grained um, definitions of different cell types and states. Um, so, for example, in our data, we can find um, immune cells that are clearly immune cells, but they don't share any characteristics with cells that we've um, that have been defined previously in, in mammals that we can tell. Um, but on the plus side, single cell sequencing is breaking the reliance that we have when working with a species like salmon on um, what we know from model species, and it allows us to directly get at genes and genomic mechanisms that are controlling fish um, performance traits at the cellular level. Um, so there's a lot of positives in terms of building a new toolbox uh, relevant directly for studying salmon performance. And I, I could go on about that longer, but I'll uh, bit there in the interest of time. 
No, no, thank you for that, Dan. And it, it is a fascinating uh, technology. I'm sure there's quite a few people really interested to explore that. So kind of looking forward to, <laughs> to further conversations, I think. Um, Jane, perhaps, perhaps you would be the best person to answer the next question. Yeah, the question from Angela. That's about right. The yeah. Resilience and mortalities, <clears throat> and took salmon and then um, land based facilities versus open ocean farms, assuming, as Angela said, that cost is not an issue. Um, so, yeah, just I think both of those systems have their pros and cons. So, yeah, in land based facilities, you can control the, the environment, but you do have restricted um, biomass unless you have very huge, very expensive farms. So, I think. The marine environment or the pan environment, freshwater or marine, is a highly efficient way to grow um, salmon. And I think what we need are the tools to make sure that we can put the right salmon in the right place at the right time so that we can avoid you know, having, having fish and warmer sites when they're large over summer. Increasing their thermal tolerance will also help um, for other times of the year. But I think it's also important to, um, to realize that um, if you've got multiple options and multiple farms, you can stock them at different times of the year. And in fact, a bit of warming um, actually increases the number of days at the salmon's optimal temperature at the moment. So really it's just having proactive management strategies for avoiding um, you know, the, the hotter times of year um, for larger salmon and using breeding as a tool to help with that. Um, so I think right. hopefully that answered your question. Yep, no, great. Thank you very much, and uh, I, I support the, those views that you expressed. Um, you know, this kind of move to precision farming and consideration of multiple factors like that. Absolutely. Um, I'm, I'm just kind of conscious of time. So, uh, Martin Knosh, I think that's that's a really nice question, and Blue Economy has sort of answered it. We have a scoping project, which we've done about um, energetic energy costs of aquaculture. And we're very much focused on looking at how to integrate renewable energy and seafood production together. So um, we've we've kind of got your link there. So we, we'll be able to kind of return the um, kind of uh, make make the link, uh, get in touch with you, and and uh, continue a conversation. So so thank you for that for that question. Um, where are we going? Have maybe maybe we've run out of questions. I oh, know. Here we go. <laughs> so here's an interesting one. This might be a, a a nice one for us all to end with a, a kind of view about a view about that. How deep is your offshore aspiration? Um, is there an opportunity to combine with offshore energy wind infrastructure? Well, um, okay. So, so the second part, yes, absolutely. That that's the blue economy uh, encapsulated in a sentence. The the whole the whole approach is for integration between renewable energies and sustainable seafood production, um, and aiming to make make the kind of most of all of the potential interactions. But but maybe you know, a final comment from all of our panel about offshore aspirations and and, and where people think on that, because uh, it's a kind of moving topic in itself. Um, so I don't know, maybe Jane first, if you... <laughs> sure. Um, yeah, well, um, there are salmon farming companies in New Zealand have aspirations to move offshore and um, New Zealand King Salmon Company, for example, has their Blue Endeavour um, application and I think that's that looks like it's been through the consenting um, process which was uh, quite onerous and expensive um, but I think the results of the appeals recently were very positive so that gives them an option to to farm a, um, a site offshore and I know that Sanford and Naitahu down in the south of Ireland um, down near Rakiora Stuart, Stuart Island uh, also have um, applications at to develop new sites down there. So there's real interest in the New Zealand industry. And I think, as I was saying before, it, it's gonna be a combination of, of the inshore farms that they already have using those in combination with open ocean sites and hopefully as well, looking at the regulatory system in New Zealand so that we can, um, I guess, have a proactive approach as well in that regard to, to making new, new and um, suitable sites available to the industry. We're kind of running out of time. Yeah, um, running out of time. So, 
Um, I've, maybe, maybe I'll just wrap up now. So apologies to the other panel members. Um, yep, I, I, absolutely. I think uh, Australia needs to, and the blue economy is there to, to kind of uh, assist that progression into offshore aquaculture. The time frame is probably next from now to 10 years as to how long it takes to move through the process. Okay, so I would now like to thank all of the speakers for giving us a really fascinating and insightful view about um, aquaculture and understanding salmon performance and all of the cutting edge technologies that have been applied to do this um, and, and really opening up our insights into the kind of production biology of salmon how how the animals work and really uh, how we use that understanding to progress the selective breeding and it it's kind of there's a, a level of optimism around that given that we have a, only been breeding salmon for a re relatively short amount of time so hopefully there's plenty of scope within the genome to be <laughs> to be able to keep going for a while so as I say thank you very much to the speakers and thank you very much to the the audience will will try and re retain those questions and 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 get back to you on the ones that we haven't been able to answer now. Um, but uh, yes, as I say, thank thank you and uh, see you in the next venue, whenever that might be. Thank you, Chris. Thanks, everyone. Everybody. Bye. Have a good Thank evening. Bye. Bye.